How does the food you eat contribute to your health? Do supplements help prevent disease? For the past 25 years, the Linus Pauling Institute has served as a world-renowned research center at Oregon State University. Our mission is to promote optimal health through cutting-edge nutrition research and trusted public outreach. We use a synergistic strategy, connecting several scientific fields to bring a better understanding to dietary components and the role that they play in obtaining optimal health. We provide that information to the world, allowing people everywhere to live longer, better lives. Welcome to the Linus Pauling Institute's webinar series. Of course, got to bring myself off mute to welcome everybody to the uh, Linus Pauling Institute's final webcast in our 25th anniversary series. My name is Dr. Alexander Michaels, and I'm a research associate and a communications officer for the Linus Pauling Institute, and I am your host today for today's talk on cancer. Uh, if we were to meet in person, this is where I would be asking everyone to squeeze in and fill in every seat, especially in the front row, because, um, well, we, we just have a lot of people for this webinar today. Um, thank goodness we don't have that problem because a thousand people have registered, nearly a thousand people have registered for today's talk. And I'm glad to see that uh, a few hundred have already made it online today. Um, this is excellent turnout for this event. I'm glad you're able to make it out here today to, uh, to join us. Um, today, we have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Emily Ho, the director of the Linus Pauling Institute. And at this point, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Ho to turn on her camera and say hello. Hi, everyone. Looking forward to spending the next hour with you. So uh, I'll give a brief intro to Dr. Dr. Ho and then the event uh, today before she gets started. But um, first, Dr. Ho came to the Oregon State University in um, 2003 after completing her doctorate in human nutrition at the other OSU, Ohio State University, plus a postdoc at the Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute, also known as Corey, at UC Berkeley. Uh, when she came to Oregon State, uh, she initially joined the faculty of the College of Public Health and Human Sciences, and then quickly uh, became a member of the Linus Pauling Institute, I think, uh, almost immediately afterwards. <laughs> uh, prior to becoming our director, uh, which just happened last year, um, she also directed the Moore Family Center for Whole Grain Foods, Nutrition and Preventative Health. And she, I think she did that for eight years uh, but prior to coming and being our director. Um, Dr. Ho's path to nutrition uh, began when she was an undergraduate student in Ontario, Canada. Um, she's an animal lover and she always thought she was going to be a veterinarian uh, until she entered a research lab and, and uh, did a summer research project on nutrition and antioxidants and eventually just got the nutrition and research bug and never looked back since. Um, Dr. Ho's work can be generally divided into two main buckets. The first one is zinc. Uh, she, she broadly looks at zinc requirements. This has helped uh, you know, the, the world uh, develop dietary recommendations for zinc. And she's been investigating the role of zinc in the healthy immune system and in cancer prevention cancer on both sides of the spectrum uh, and, and investigating the requirements of zinc intake as we age. The other side of Dr. Ho's research, oh, actually, I should mention that um, she, Dr. Ho gave a webinar last year at about this time uh, called Think Zinc. It was one of the Knowledge Breaks series for the uh, Alumni Association. And if you are interested in, in hearing more about Dr. Ho's work on zinc, go to our YouTube page and you will see that video uh, and you can hear all about her zinc work. But today we're going to hear about cruciferous vegetables, in particular, cruciferous vegetables and broccoli, uh, broccoli in particular, and cruciferous vegetables and cancer, uh, and, and the anti-cancer effects of sulforaphane. Now, I'm not going to talk about that too much because Dr. Ho is going to go into that momentarily, but um, before I get too far into the actual presentation, I wanted to tell you just how this webinar is going to work today. This is very Typical for one of our webinars. Uh, after my introduction, Dr. Ho is going to present. Uh, she will also have, and this is kind of new for this webinar, a, a short demonstration on how to sprout your own broccoli seeds. 
uh, or make broccoli sprouts. And then we're gonna go into a question and answer session. And I'll talk more about the question and answer session later, but uh, if you do have a question for Dr. Ho on the topic of broccoli or cancer or cruciferous vegetables or sulforaphane, just type it into the Q&A box, which is down below at the bottom of this Zoom window. Um, don't put it in the chat because we don't look, look at the chat for questions. That's in just the Q&A section. And of course, we've got a lot of questions that already were submitted at the beginning of this. So uh, we will definitely have some questions to ask Dr. Ho at the end. And so without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Ho to the virtual stage and have her start her presentation. Oh. oh, oh, there you go. Your mic's now live. Go. Oh, okay. I don't know. I always have, you'd think by now to have figured out how to do this, but um, thank you for the kind of introduction. I'm glad so many people are here with us today. So what we're going to do is uh, hear about why they like to call me the broccoli lady um, here on campus. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the science. We're going to do a little bit of the application in terms of how you incorporate some of these um, compounds from broccoli into your daily lives, and then we'll have some time for some questions. So without further ado, I'm gonna get my slide started. All right, well, I'm really excited to spend the next hour or so with you all uh, talking about one of my favorite vegetables, broccoli, and the power it has in your health, especially against devastating diseases uh, such as cancer. Just as a, a brief reminder, the mission of the Lyons Pauling Institute is to promote optimal health through cutting edge nutrition research and trusted public outreach. We strive to both discover and enable um, individuals and communities to tip the balance towards optimal health. Um, I'm really excited to share with you some of my own research today um, and much of the information that has been enabled uh, by the Linus Pauling Institute. So why do we care about cancer? Heart disease, cerebrovascular disease like stroke, um, and cancer um, are the three leading causes of death in the United States today. Over the last uh, many decades, there have been huge medical advances uh, in each of these diseases. Uh, since the 50s, there's been a huge drop in the number of people dying uh, for, from heart disease, for example. You can see here uh, close to a 70% decrease since the 50s to 2010 um, in terms of number of people um, dying from heart disease. Similarly, when we look at stroke, um, we can see uh, a similar um, almost 80% uh, drop in terms of of number of deaths from stroke. Over the same time period, what do we see with cancer? We note uh, there isn't that same uh, level of drop with cancer, and, and, and this is a problem. Uh, we have not seen uh, this equivalent drops um, in cancer death rates. Uh, and my, my call to, to you and call to action is, let's start to think about this in a different way. Um, and in particular, let's think more about prevention as a strategy to combat uh, cancer and, and win the fight potentially against cancer. So to win the fight against cancer, we really need to understand the causes of cancer. And it's interesting, if I ask you, if you smoke five packs of cigarettes a day, does that increase your risk for cancer? Um, it doesn't matter what walk of life you come from, your background. Most people have that strong association that smoking a lot increases your risk of cancer. Uh, and that's, that's very well established, very well known. If I ask that same question, does what you eat uh, contribute to your cancer or to contribute to your risk of cancer? That association um, isn't nearly as strong um, in the general population. What's interesting, though, is you, if you actually look at the data, um, in the US, perturbations in diet um, actually contribute to more cases of cancer than does even smoking. And yet again, that association of what you eat and your cancer risk is, is, is not nearly as strong. Um, and I challenge you uh, all to think about that um, a little bit more. Um, and I'm going to provide a little bit more evidence of this um, as the talk goes on. So we know that cancer uh, is a, a genetic disorder. It tends to run in family. And there's a, sometimes a thought that there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, when in fact, there's a lot you can do. Uh, around 40% of cancer cases can be prevented. Uh, and diet really does play a, a major role in this. 
So when we think about that smoking and diet comparison that I talked about in the previous slide, um, it isn't quite a fair comparison. Uh, smoking is a, is a single expo exposure, but when we talk about diet imbalances, there are, are, are multiple things um, that, that are going on. Uh, one, there are components um, in our diet they may, that may promote cancer. Uh, things like uh, red and processed meat, um, uh, uh, high consumption of, of processed foods and excess calories. Uh, obesity is known to be a, a strong risk factor for uh, many cancers. And then on the flip side, there are also many foods that a typical American diet may lack uh, that have protective components. Uh, we know that things like physical activity, uh, which I'm not going to talk a lot about today, um, also significantly decreases your risk for cancer. Um, and again, there are many foods um, that also are protective. Um, here, this slide points to foods that uh, contain fiber, um, and I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about uh, the power, again, of, of broccoli as a food that could significantly decrease our risk. So when we think about this diet association, uh, again, the typical American diet is not the best diet. Uh, we know that approximately 25% of Americans are eating uh, enough fruits and vegetables, getting their five to nine servings of, of vegetables. That means 75%, so three out of four people in the United States are not eating uh, enough fruits and vegetables. Uh, I've done a lot of work with particular class of vegetables that again, tends to be one that isn't highly consumed on average. Um, our vegetables in this brassica family are um, also called uh, cruciferous vegetables. So these cruciferous vegetables, um, again, belong to this brassica family. Uh, I like to joke in some of my classes that this class of vegetables is also the kids will not eat them vegetable. Um, frankly, a lot of adults will not eat them either. Um, and the reason why kids and lots of people uh, tend to not like these vegetables as much is they have a, a characteristic bitter taste. That characteristic taste that's associated with these vegetables like cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, kale, Brussels sprouts um, is due to a, a a uh, phytochemical or chemical, a plant-derived chemical uh, that's called a glucosinolate. Again, that glucosinolate gives the characteristic bitter taste to these vegetables, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, these glucosinolates act as precursors to a class of compounds that we and many others have found have cancer-fighting properties. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So when we think about broccoli, um, it's a fabulous food. Uh, what's good about it? lots of things. Uh, as already mentioned, it tends to be a, a high fiber food. Uh, it also uh, is a, a low fat food. It contains lots of uh, essential uh, vitamins and, and minerals, uh, things like folate, which is a B vitamin, um, antioxidant nutrients. And in addition to these uh, essential nutrients, uh, broccoli also contains several plant-derived chemicals or phytochemicals that also have numerous health benefits. It contains uh, these indole compounds um, that uh, another, another fellow researcher at the Linus Pauling Institute, Dr. Dave Williams, um, studies extensively. It contains chlorophylls, which have also been studied uh, by the Institute in terms of cancer fighting properties. And I'm going to talk quite a bit more about these glucosinolates. Uh, so these glucosinolates are precursors to another class of compound called isothiocyanates that again appear to have some strong cancer fighting properties. Uh, so one of the compounds uh, that we study uh, in particular, it seems to be a really uh, great candidate as a cancer fighter is this compound called sulforaphane and, and it's nisothiocyanate. So in foods, uh, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, we find sulforaphane in a precursor form as a glucosinolate um, and it's called uh, glucoraphanin here. Uh, glucoraphanin is basically a precursor to sulforaphane. It's the same compound, it just has this glucose um, that's stuck to it. So to, to fully realize the cancer-fighting property of sulforaphane, uh, we need to, to cut off this glucose uh, and release it uh, so it's available to our bodies. Within the plant cell walls, there's a compartment uh, that contains an enzyme called myrosinase. And this enzyme can cut that glucose off um, and free the sulforaphane to the sulforaphane very effectively. Uh, it's kept um, in this separate compartment, so it's not released until the cell walls are, are broken. So when we chew or cut the broccoli, um, either through, again, regular chewing, um, if you throw it in food processor, um, chew up uh, or cut up the broccoli well, 
you break down those cell walls that releases the enzyme, uh, then uh, that enzyme is able to effectively cut off that glucose and hence uh, release the active form um, as sulforaphane that's available to us uh, for health benefits. Uh, our gut bacteria um, in, uh, within our um, intestines, uh, or our large intestine in particular, um, also contain uh, this enzyme as well. So if the plant is not able to do it, we have a little bit of a backup system uh, in terms of bacteria. So your gut health will also help uh, determine whether or not we can effectively uh, release the active form. Uh, the precursor form, again, is, is not active uh, and is basically inert in terms of cancer fighting properties. So this step is, is critical for us to be able to uh, release the sulforaphane for positive benefit. So there are um, several factors that are gonna affect um, activation of uh, the sulforaphane to its uh, isothiocyanate. So things um, again, like chewing, um, cutting up um, the broccoli well. Um, I also wanna mention cooking is gonna have uh, an impact. Um, if you cook your broccoli, you can potentially destroy the that enzyme that's in the plant um, and hence will not be able to release um, the sulforaphane or the isothiocyanates. Again, the, the gut bacteria does act as a bit of a backup, um, but it will be, be a little bit dependent on your overall gut health. Um, and two, the enzyme in the bacteria isn't quite as efficient as the one in the plant. Does this mean you should only consume uh, raw broccoli? Not necessarily. Uh, luckily, uh, this enzyme is pretty efficient. Uh, so you only need a little bit of the enzyme. So if you do cook your broccoli, uh, one thing that we would recommend uh, in terms of optimizing the release of sulforaphane is if you do cook it, is to not cook it all the way to mushiness. Um, uh, a five minute steam, a light cooking, uh, as long as you still have a little bit of, of crunch um, to the broccoli, that means you still have some live uh, cell walls and live enzyme. Uh, so you can cook your broccoli, just not totally well. Again, even in cooked broccoli, though, you will be able to release um, some of the sulforaphane uh, through the gut bacteria. So how does sulforaphane work? Uh, so Sulforaphane has been studied as a cancer-fighting compound for, for many, many decades. Um, some of the early work was done by a researcher from John Hopkins University uh, named Dr. Paul Taule, and he made the landmark discovery that sulforaphane was an inducer of a very special transcription factor called NRF2. Um, this transcription factor assists with the induction of antioxidant pathways and detoxification pathways. So sulforaphane ends up being an excellent um, detoxifier, and I'll talk a little bit more um, about how that works shown here. So this is a, a broccoli. It releases its sulforaphane, as I just mentioned. Um, so NRF2 um, is bound in the cytosol, uh, bound to an inhibitory unit called uh, KEEP1. And what sulforaphane is able to do is help release this inhibitory unit from NRF2. That release then frees the NRF2 to be able to translocate to the nucleus where it binds to things uh, like the antioxidant response element, which then turns on genes and tells the cell um, to make more um, detoxifying um, agents and antioxidants to help combat against uh, mutagens, carcinogens, uh, other xenobiotic or, or damaging um, agents. Uh, so it's an excellent way to help rid our bodies of potential cancer causing toxins. So we know that the development of cancer is an extremely complicated and, and complex process. Um, in the classic etiology of cancer, um, it's thought that cancer starts off with an initiating event uh, where uh, exposure to a carcinogen, a mutagen, uh, causes DNA damage, so physical change to the DNA um, that when replicated uh, causes a, a change in function in the cell um, that results in uncontrolled uh, cell proliferation. This eventually can progress um, into tumor, tumor formation um, that may either be benign uh, or malignant. So if sulforaphane only worked via NRF2 in this detoxification pathway, um, it would really only be helpful in this very 
early uh, of the process um, and when you know you're going to be exposed to toxins. Luckily, though, sulforaphane is an excellent multitasker um, and appears to help stop the cancer process, um, even in some of these later stages. Uh, and in particular, uh, one of the things that our lab and other labs have found is that sulforaphane um, also helps stop the cancer process through a, a process involving epigenetics. So what is epigenetics? Um, so to contrast uh, genetic uh, versus epigenetic modifications, um, a genetic modification is a change in, in DNA, a physical change in the DNA. Uh, so for example, um, that DNA damage that uh, we just talked about, um, that damage uh, or change in the DNA causes an inability to create a protein um, and uh, makes the, the protein non-functional. An epigenetic modification literally means outside the DNA. Um, it does not change the DNA sequence directly, but it still changes the way that the gene is expressed um, and how that protein is made and still can result in a non-functional protein. Okay, so what, what does this really mean? So if you think about our DNA, um, it contains uh, all the information uh, that our cells need to do their job. So it's very much uh, like the library of, of our cells. It contains all the information um, and we need to be able to, to read that information so our, our bodies and our cells are able to do the job that, that, that they need to. Um, similar to uh, all the books in the library, um, we have a lot of DNA uh, and that DNA needs to be compacted um, into a small space uh, to be able to be uh, functional within in, in the cell. Uh, if you visit our, our library here on campus, the Valley Library, you'll, you'll, you may notice that we have these, these crazy moving bookshelves that similarly help compact all the many, many books um, into a, small, a smaller space. Um, so again, for us to be able to use the information from the DNA, uh, we need uh, to be able to access the books uh, and we need to be able to read it. So in the library, what you do is when you need to get your book, uh, you head over to these shelves, uh, you press a, a button um, on the shelf, um, and that will open up the shelf. So then you can go in, get the book, read it, um, and uh, get the instructions uh, and the information that you need. Our DNA does the same thing. Um, our DNA is compacted um, into these proteins um, called uh, histones that are kind of like these, these shelves. Um, and these histones um, allow DNA these very long DNA sequences to be wound around them and compacted into a small space um, inside our cells. So what does this mean in terms of cancer? So we used to think that cancer and the problems associated uh, uh, that start, kickstart and progress through cancer was a problem uh, with the book. Um, it was Either the book is missing, uh, a page is ripped out, so you can't get the information and the cell goes, go, goes crazy. We now know that sometimes it isn't a problem with the book itself, but actually it's more of a problem with the button on the shelf. Uh, and the net result is the same. Um, because that button isn't working, the shelf does not open, the cell can't access the information, misinformation happens and the cell uh, goes a little bit crazy um, in terms of uh, cell proliferation and potential um, cancer progression. This knowledge that epigenetics um, also plays a role in this dysfunction that leads to cancer has caused a huge paradigm shift in the way that we think about cancer and importantly about possible prevention and therapeutic strategies. Uh, so for example, uh, a DNA mutation um, or a, a page that's ripped out of that book uh, is really hard to fix. Uh, but epigenetic changes, this button, is something that's fixable. And uh, we uh, and others have found uh, that sulforaphane um, from broccoli um, is a great button fixer and has really uh, potentially revolutionized the way that we think about sulforaphane uh, in terms of cancer progression, that it's not just that early stage that it can impact but later stages as well. Um, in terms of what are these epigenetic alterations, so again, our DNA is tightly wound around these core histone proteins. Um, it's compacted into these nucleosome structures. Um, there are tags uh, that are not physical changes in the DNA um, on these proteins, um, such as methylation, uh, phosphorylation, you 
biquination, biotillination, and we've done a lot of work with acetylation. Um, and again, these tags change uh, how the DNA opens and closes um, and can alter function that um, is often dysregulated um, in, in cancer. Um, there are other forms of epigenetics, um, such as uh, DNA methylation and non-coding RNAs um, as, as well. But again, we've done a lot of work uh, more with the histones, uh, in particular histone deacetylases um, and the impact of the, uh, the sulforaphane compounds on these epigenetic alterations. So what have we seen that happens? When we feed uh, animals that have, um, in this case, they have a, a prostate tumor implanted, we feed them um, high sulforaphane. Uh, what we can find is um, on here, we have tumor growth. And you can see in green, um, the animals that were uh, that consumed um, sulforaphane, they have slower uh, tumor growth compared to the animals that did not get um, the sulforaphane. You can also show um, that the sulforaphane uh, is working very effectively as that button uh, fixer. Um, so here we're looking at histone deacetylase activity, uh, which is the enzyme that um, adds the acetyl group on uh, to those histones that again, um, alter that, that access and opening and closing of the DNA. And we can show that sulforaphane effectively uh, uh, is able to inhibit uh, that enzyme, again, that button pusher. Um, and we can see that it happens um, in the tumor, in the blood cells, um, and it's within the prostate. We can also show um, in uh, a model, uh, so in this model, uh, we have animals that have a genetic mutation um, that predisposes them to developing prostate cancer. So 100% of these animals develop prostate cancer at, at, by six months of age. Uh, we look at tumor scores uh, when we feed the animals a high uh, broccoli diet. And you can see in green, um, the animals that get, uh, got the broccoli. So we see in the bottom tumor scores, higher number means worse tumors. Um, and you can see that there's a progression of, of, of tumors, but the animals that got the broccoli, you can see that the scores are shifted left. Uh, so the animals, so despite having a genetic predisposition, um, so again, a, a change um, that, that, that can't be changed, um, and a high risk for prostate cancer, the broccoli diet uh, was able to, to slow down uh, the progression of, 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 of the tumors in this case. So what does this mean in terms of people? Uh, so when we look at the levels of sulforaphane and the levels of broccoli that we fed um, in our animal models, it was a lot of broccoli. Good news is, um, is that our plants are, are pretty smart and our plants produce all of that glucosinolate um, that's produced, um, that makes that sulforaphane at the seed level, which means um, the seed um, contains all the, the sulforaphane potential that, that, uh, that the whole big broccoli does. So we have done a lot of work with broccoli sprouts. Um, so these you know, three to six day old um, sprouts contain the same amount of glucosinolate as the big grown broccoli. So on a per mass basis, um, it, contains, it can contain up to 50 times more the glucosinolate than a mature plant, uh, which means um, in terms of potentially getting more bang for your buck, you know, you could eat um, 50 cups of broccoli or a single cup of, of broccoli sprouts. Um, and we've done a lot of studies uh, looking at the effects of, of broccoli sprouts. Um, in particular, uh, we've had the uh, fortune of collaborating with Oregon Health Science University to do a couple clinical trials. I'm going to show you data from one of our breast cancer trials uh, where we recruited um, a uh, just over 50 women. These were women um, that were scheduled for biopsies because of an abnormal mammogram. Um, and uh, prior to their biopsy surgery, were randomized to either a broccoli sprout extract supplement um, or a, a placebo. They were on these supplements for um, as little as three weeks, as much as two months. Uh, and we looked at uh, histone deacetylase, so that button pushing mechanism, and um, some other markers of, of, of breast cancer as well. And what we found was indeed um, women that took um, the broccoli sprout extract supplement um, had a, a decrease in their histone deacetylase activity. So we were able to affect that epigenetic um, marker 
In addition, we looked at some prognosis markers. So in this case, it's a marker called KI67, which signals um, active proliferation. So again, cancer is a disorder of uncontrolled cell proliferation. So strategies to slow down that proliferation um, is, is, is positive in terms of, of slowing down uh, cancer growth and prognosis for breast cancer. Um, and we could also find uh, that with the supplementation strategy, we were able to see decreases in KI67 staining, which indicates a uh, potential slowing down of, of, of tumor growth. And this is uh, was very exciting in terms of potential of sulforaphane um, in fighting against cancers such as, uh, as uh, breast cancer. We also have done some studies in prostate cancer, um, but I want to highlight there are numerous clinical trials with sulforaphane that are currently um, in process um, and have been completed um, around, around the world. Um, several uh, in my lab, we've done a lot of work with breast and prostate cancer, uh, but there's been a lot of work um, in other cancers, so lung cancer, especially in terms of mitigating smoking toxicity. So looking at both at that detoxification as well as potential later on um, effects, um, head and neck cancers, uh, melanoma, um, and colon cancer as well. Um, if you search uh, clinical on clinicaltrials.gov, you'll, you'll find a whole host of studies, even outside cancers as, uh, as well in terms of the potential benefits of, of sulforaphane. So what does this mean for you? Uh, what can you do for your cancer prevention? Um, it, it's not terrible rocket science. What you can do in terms of uh, potential strategies for cancer prevention. Uh, one, you need to, to stay active. Again, um, I haven't talked a lot about that, uh, but staying active, um, preventing obesity uh, is also a major factor. Um, eat your fruits and vegetables um, is, a, is another major thing you can do. And in particular, something that I norm, uh, would advocate is, is incorporate those cruciferous vegetables um, um, into your diet on a regular basis. Um, another thing that we have found is that regular consumption really uh, is, is more key than just doing it once, um, every once in a while. Uh, and what about those of you who still say, no way, I'm not going to eat broccoli? Um, I encourage you to try these broccoli sprouts. Um, just a couple broccoli sprouts, again, have a lot of power in terms of that sulforaphane um, potential, and they're really easy to kind of hide into sandwiches or, or, or other salads, and you still get um, a lot of benefit. So I'm going to show you um, um, a little bit uh, in terms of, you know, if you are interested in these broccoli sprouts, um, you can get them sometimes in the grocery stores and they're really easy to grow at home as well. So I'm going to show you how to do that in, in a moment. So how do we apply the science of broccoli and sulforaphane to our daily lives? I'm going to talk to you about how you can grow your own broccoli sprouts at home for you and your family. So growing your broccoli sprouts is, is actually really easy. You only need a few supplies um, and a little bit of time. It's really quite satisfying because you go really from these broccoli seeds uh, to five days later, uh, a whole jar full of uh, yummy uh, broccoli sprouts. So I'm going to go over uh, some of the things that you need and how to do it. So let's get to it. So you don't need a lot. So what you need, um, we grow our broccoli sprouts in a mason jar. So that this is our broccoli uh, sprout growing vessel. Um, we'll need to fashion uh, a way to drain uh, the water from your growing vessel and we'll need some broccoli seeds. Um, so first off to make uh, the draining piece, um, I simply get a, a mesh stainless steel, um, Simply draw a circle um, the, the size of your mason jar um, and cut this out. Um, and then we're gonna fix that um, onto our, our lid. You can also uh, pre-purchase uh, pre-made uh, mesh grids um, if you want to as well. Um, you also, you don't have to use the stainless steel. You can use uh, plastic ones as, as well, um, or you can even use a cheesecloth. It's just something to be able to, to drain um, the, the water from your seeds. So the broccoli seed uh, I have pictured here, um, there's nothing terribly special about the broccoli seeds that you need to, to get. Um, I do recommend trying to purchase um, seeds that are meant for sprouting. Um, that tends to have slightly better yield than the seeds that are geared for growing broccoli in the soil, but you can get these at any uh, of your uh, local garden stores. The first thing that we need to do is clean our broccoli seeds. Uh, one of the biggest, um, 
uh, concerns with consuming broccoli sprouts or any sprouts is potential bacteria or microbial contamination. So even if your seeds are certified, I highly recommend to just as a safe measure, um, sanitize and, and clean your seeds so they're free of any bacteria. Um, and the way that we do this is we use very, very um, diluted bleach. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, uh, you can also use undiluted uh, vinegar, white vinegar, apple apple cider vinegar, um, but I'm going to show you the way that we do it uh, with the bleach. So what we do, I've already added water to our mason jar. Um, I'm going to add one quarter teaspoon of, of bleach um, to here. We'll just give that um, a bit of a mix. So it's, again, very um, diluted bleach solution. I have one tablespoon of uh, broccoli seed that I'm going to add. Um, if you have a larger jar, um, you can also use larger jar, quart, uh, half gallon. Um, here's an example of a half gallon. Uh, half gallon, I usually add one quarter cup of seed. Uh, for the quart, I add two tablespoons. So we are going to uh, take this. Uh, let me make a bit of another stir. Um, and now we're going to let that cleaning solution do its bacteria uh, killing. So I'm going to go ahead and set a timer uh, for 15 minutes um, and let that uh, cleaning solution do its job. So after 15 minutes have, have gone by, uh, I'm going to take my lid with that screen uh, on top. And I'm going to rinse this out really, really well. So I have a makeshift sink here. I'm going to dump out uh, the water. Uh, I'm going to do this at least 10 times. So I recommend for about 10 minutes to constantly add more water, dump it out, add more water, swirl it around, dump it out, and do that for about 10 minutes to ensure um, you've got all that cleaning solution gone. Uh, when we come back, um, after the sleeves are clean, the next step is to soak our seeds. Uh, and this will allow for that sprouting. So I'm going to add water back to our mason jar, um, about two thirds full. And this time I'm not going to dump it. I'm just going to allow the, the seeds to sit. I'm going to swirl it around just to get all the seeds in there. And this is going to sit um, overnight um, in a, a dark place away from sunlight for 12 hours. Um, so we're going to take that away. And then for the next few days, um, morning and night, what we're gonna do is take this jar and rinse it out um, just a couple times. So again, don't need to take your lid off, um, just simply dump out the water, uh, add water back in, and then just do that uh, a couple times. Just to rinse out the seeds. And at this point, we want the seeds to try to remain a little bit dry. Um, so we want to now store the seeds. I like to take the jar, tap it along the little side just to spread out the seeds on the walls a little bit. And then we're gonna place it on an angle um, in, a, in a bowl. Um, you can uh, purchase you know, sprouting kits that will help hold the knife, but I find just putting it in a bowl works perfectly fine. This allows this to drain uh, over, over time. Uh, and we're gonna do that every day, morning and night for the next uh, few days, rinse um, and drain. So what we'll see over the next few days, so here are our seeds that we've started. Um, they've been sanitized and rinsed. And again, we're just gonna keep them out of direct sunlight um, and every day rinse them twi twice a day. And you'll see in a couple days, we'll start to see some of our uh, sprouts to, to emerge uh, by uh, usually around day four, so three days after, you'll start to see significant sprouts. And then by day four, you'll see quite a bit of sprouts. Um, you can harvest them at this point if you wanted to. I tend to let them go um, until day six, so five full days after we've prepared them and I get a nice big full um, cup of, of broccoli sprouts. Um, what I do afterwards is I dump the sprouts out into a bowl with some water, um, simply uh, mix them around a little bit uh, to help dissociate those seed hulls from the sprouts, um, throw them in a colander to drain them a little bit, and then further dry them onto uh, a towel. These sprouts are ready to consume. Um, you can throw them in your soups or your salads. Um, you can also freeze them away if you don't want to consume them. The sprouts are generally good for about three to five days. Store them in the refrigerator. Um, again, try to keep them dry if you can. If you can't consume them in that, uh, in that time, you can throw them in the freezer. Um, 
if you are going to use those frozen sprouts, so that appears to retain um, that active enzyme, that myrosinase that we've been talking about, but you do want to use those frozen sprouts right away. Um, so throw them into your food processor, your blender for a smoothie. Don't allow them to thaw too much, um, otherwise you'll lose that sulforaphane. So um, I hope you can try this at home and uh, you uh, enjoy uh, your broccoli sprouts. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, we have uh, created a guide um, in terms of a, a document that goes through that process of growing your broccoli sprouts. Uh, we'll make sure that's available. I'll see if my colleagues can put it in the chat. And then if you, um, uh, we'll be sending out some emails um, after the conferences as well uh, and um, let you know how to get um, the resources as well as some of the resources that I shared uh, within, the, in the, within the presentation uh, as, as well. Okay. Uh, well, the, actually, Emily, I think I just got it up in the chat, so uh, everyone should Great. have access to that, um, the directions. Uh, I did uh, I'll, I'll like to thank you for that presentation and the demonstration. That was all wonderful. I love hearing about this whole fluorophane because it's a really hot topic in cancer and nutrition research at the moment. Um, so, um, and that's not just because broccoli sprouts taste a little spicy. Uh, actually, that's one thing I was going to mention to you, but I'll get to that in just a second. Um, <clears throat> so uh, now we're going to move on to our, our, our question and answer session. Um, but uh, before I do so, I noticed that a couple of people have their hands up. Um, we prefer that if anyone who has their hand up and wants to ask a question to put it in the q a section and not in uh we have no other way of of addressing your hands being up uh the chat unfortunately is not working in this uh scenario so just put your comment if you if it's a comment put it in the q a section if there's nothing that we can address uh, or if you can't access the Q&A section for some reason, um, you can always send us an email and we can address it after the uh, webinar is over. Um, so I'm going to, as people continue to write in questions, this is a good time to enter all your questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to go over some ground rules. Uh, the, the Alliance Pauling Institute is not a medical institution, so we're not going to be talking about specific medical issues. Uh, we can't give any recommendations for a, a disease or a specific cancer that you have, for example. So all the recommendations that we give are going to be very general, and all the questions that we're going to address are kind of general in that uh, regard. I mean. Uh, we can we can't address all the specific medical needs uh, without you know we're not physicians let's just put it that way um we're also not going to be fielding any questions that are off topic uh you can email us those questions but if there's anything not relevant to the topic of, of uh, cancer cruciferous vegetables sulforaphane broccoli we're not going to be touching it today um i know that a lot of people send us questions on vitamin c which is a very popular topic for the Lions Paul Institute, you can go ahead and send them all to me and I will address them after the, the webinar is over. That said, um, let's get on to the Q&A section. Um, and I think what I'm gonna start with is a couple questions about broccoli sprouts. Um, the first one that, that I was interested in knowing is, uh, and this is just kind of going over your procedure that you went through, Emily. Um, why do you wash the broccoli sprouts every day? Yeah, so the, the washing does help uh, with um, especially the one thing that's the as you go, uh, you can get mold um, in your broccoli sprouts as well. So the 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 washing uh, does 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 help kind of mitigate mitigate that uh, washing with with, with the drying. Um, I also see some questions um, in terms of the that sanitization process with the yeah. vinegar. Um, and uh, same procedure with the vinegar. So the vinegar is undiluted. Um, you put it in that jar, um, almost a full, you just wanna make sure you cover all, um, all the seeds. Still let it soak for about 15 minutes. Um, you can go up to 30 minutes with both the bleach solution and the vinegar. Uh, I wouldn't go any further than 30 minutes though, because then um, you may dry out the seeds too much and drying out the seeds uh, will uh, prohibit some of the growth as well. So um, I usually aim for 15 minutes, no more than 30. Okay. So straight vinegar as, as much as it needs to cover the seeds or, or as much as you would have for the bleach solution mm -hmm. and then, and then drain it uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Um, so yeah, definitely don't dilute your vinegar because that would dilute the uh, acid content and make it less effective. Um, so 
Uh, the next question I, ha I had about sprouts, and I asked you this before, was uh, do you have to keep them in the dark the whole time or do you do you want to get them in some light at some point? Yeah, the um, you can put them out in the light in those last stages. <laughs> in terms of the uh, kind of the sprouting process and, and sulforaphane, the light doesn't matter um, as much. Um, but so what I usually do is keep them out of the um, in the dark um, or at least out of direct sunlight for up to that uh, that day four. Okay. Uh, and then once I start to see the sprouts um, a little more concernedly, um, I'll bring them out into the light a little bit more, and then that'll help uh, the sprouts turn more green, uh, which uh, you know the chlorophylls and some of those other um, uh, green compounds also have some some potential health benefits as well. That's a good segue, actually, because uh, I was going to talk about the the compounds that we are that you're finding in these uh, sprouts. Well, actually, before I get into that, uh, somebody did ask about other sprouts, like other cruciferous vegetables. Or do you know of any health benefits to other sprouts in the same cruciferous vegetable category? Yeah, no, that is a great question. Um, so. Uh, different types of cruciferous vegetables um, have different profiles of these glucosinolates. Uh, so broccoli um, just tends to have more of that glucoraphanin, which is that sulforaphane precursor. Um, but there's many other um, glucosinolates that also have health benefits. So something like um, if you were wanting to sprout something like watercress, um, it has a, another isothiocyanate called phenethyl uh, isothiocyanate or a precursor to it um, that also appears to have some health benefits. Um, other cruciferous vegetables have um, those indole compounds as well. Um, those compounds are also produced um, in the seed. Um, unlike glucoraphanin, though, the, the seed will, uh, as, uh, the plant will continue to create more um, the glucoprocissin. Um, so uh, the sprout will also have more concentrated availability of those indoles, but you'll still have a, the proportion uh, from full grown to sprout uh, is a little bit not as wide with some of the indole compounds. But um, the other sprouts um, definitely have um, other compounds, other glucosinolates, and other nutrients that also are potentially benefits. Yeah, so the, um, I guess this is a good place to mention that there, there's a wide variety of isothiocyanates up there. And this is just a class of compounds that have a, a nitrogen, uh, carbon, and sulfur. Uh, that's the isothiocyanate group that we're talking about here. Uh, Sulforaphane is just one of them. So there was a question on, on precursor. What is a precursor? Um, if you want to describe that in, in more simple terms, um, we talk about you talk about glucoraphanin uh yeah you know, how what what does precursor mean and uh how what are the steps to get to the yes, actual yeah. compound you want so one thing i didn't mention as clearly um that sulforaphane or these isothiocyanates are actually not that stable uh, so uh, they react with things pretty readily, so they don't stick around uh, for a long time. Um, so in the plant, uh, the sulforaphane is in a, a form that's more stable. Um, so it's got a, a glucose stuck on it that allows the, the compound to be more stable. Uh, so that's the precursor, kind of the building block for the active compound. And it's, and it's built in a certain way because it, it, it's, it, it's more stable, but unfortunately, it also means it's not reactive. Um, so it doesn't do the health benefit things. Um, so when, when we consume the plant, um, again, what we need to do is activate it um, and get it out of the the stable form that actually does something. And that's where that enzyme morosinase comes in, where it helps cut off the glucose, um, but now activates uh, the glucosinolate uh, to its, its active form. Um, but unfortunately, that active form is also not as stable, which is why um, you need to consume um, the broccoli uh, fairly soon. So for example, if you uh, made a smoothie with your broccoli sprouts, um, you would release the enzyme, you would release the sulforaphane, but if you let it sit for many hours, uh, a lot of that sulforaphane may start to react um, and would not be um, in its active form any longer. Yeah, uh, I mean, especially when we were working in the laboratory environment, we're, we're working as fast as we can and usually trying to take steps to minimize that degradation because it does happen so fast. So the faster, the better. And that's, I guess, brings you the, the frozen broccoli sprouts that you mentioned, you know, if you're going to thaw them and use them, use them right away, you know, eat them right away, get them in your stomach. <laughs> yeah. Where at least they'll live for a little longer. Um, so 
okay, going going to sulforaphane. Um, you mentioned that sulforaphane has some epigenetic effects. Uh, you mentioned histone deacetylases uh, in particular. Um, does does it have any other epigenetic effects that that are noted, or is it just mostly on the deacetylases? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so one, uh, the process of, of epigenetics is also a complicated process, and all those different modifications that I mentioned, like DNA methylation, uh, all the different histone modifications, uh, non coding RNA, they kind of talk to each other uh, in terms of uh, regulating that opening and closing of the DNA. Uh, so uh, sulforaphane so uh, does appear to uh, affect some of these other pathways. It's unclear if it's a direct effect or more of a consequence of um, some of that crosstalk. Um, but the bottom line is a lot of those other epigenetic alterations um, also make an impact, and which is one reason um, why uh, not just thinking of sulforaphane, you know, eating a, a full diet with many different compounds uh, also may hit some of those other uh, other pathways that may be of, of, of benefit in terms of synergistically uh, keeping your cells in control. Yeah, um, there, there's there's actually a comment in, in one of the questions about you know eating turmeric, EGCG, uh, and other you know other phytochemicals mixed in with uh, sulforaphane precursors to try to get uh, benefits from all of those, and uh, they all could be affecting different epigenetic pathways in cancer. Um, let me ask about long-term effects. Do you see any harm in consuming uh, a broccoli or broccoli sprouts long-term? So far, at least from our food sources, um, there doesn't seem to be any long-term um, side effects or, or impacts. Um, we do have to, uh, I guess, think about, uh, well, one thing I mentioned in my presentation that regular consumption uh, does seem to trump uh, high dose, but very, very uh, occasionally. Um, you know, in our studies, we have used a lot um, uh, that uh, about a cup of broccoli sprouts, um, which is which which is a pretty decent amount of of, of, of sulforaphane to eat a full cup of broccoli sprouts um, every single day. So far, we haven't seen um, been, um, any ill uh, side effects in either our clinical trials um, or even in our more short term, uh, uh, both short term and long term trials. Um, but it's something that uh, we also, though, we just don't know. You know when we do these clinical trials, uh, we try to do the, the, what we think will work the best. Um, and we haven't tightered down in terms of, do we actually need that, that, that amount? Um, we can show in some of our other studies that just look at cruciferous vegetable intake, again, regular cruciferous vegetable intake on the order of a, just a cup of regular cruciferous vegetables um, seems to be associated in breast cancer patients with that decreased KIC. 67, that cell proliferation marker as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the women that ate um, the high dose supplement, but just women who also regularly ate cruciferous vegetables on a daily basis also seem to have that prognosis marker uh, dampened compared to women who had no cruciferous vegetables in their diet. Okay. So, so I guess what you're saying is, uh, yeah, long-term effects don't seem to be there with food. And it doesn't seem to be massive quantities that are needed. I mean, you don't necessarily need to take this in a supplement form. Uh, it seems like you can get plenty, if you want to call it that, from uh, food. Yeah, and I will also point out in terms of um, potential side effects. I mean, there are some, some cases where too much sulforaphane uh, or too much broccoli, uh, especially at a supplemental level, may be... Uh, uh, more dangerous, um, especially if you're taking a lot of medications. Um, mm -hmm. yes. um, uh, because of the NRF2. So what NRF2 does is induce these detoxification pathways and these antioxidant pathways um, and things like chemotherapeutics, um, they work by producing oxidants. Uh, so there may be um, some yin and yang, I guess, uh, or uh, antagonism that you might have to be worried about. Um, there's also concern, uh, there's a compound, uh, these isothiocytes isothiocyanates also act as uh, what are called uh, goitrogens, uh, which is uh, a big long name for something that uh, interacts with iodine. Um, iodine is uh, uh, an essential nutrient that we need to 
uh, build thyroid hormones. So when you're uh, iodine deficient, um, you may impair your thyroid hormone function. Um, at this point, even at these high doses, uh, we have not seen um, any impairment of thyroid function uh, with isothiocyanates, but um, there may be sub subpopulations, especially those that have um, uh, thyroid conditions um, that may need to be cautious. Yeah, uh, those are, those are definitely good tips. Uh, I, I I think we definitely need to caution people who've got pre-existing conditions, especially if they're under drug treatment therapy, as you mentioned. Um, NRF two may not be a great thing, uh, just depending. Um, what was the question I was going to ask? Uh, there, there, there's several about preparation. And I'll get into some of those in just a second. Um, let's talk about, so you, you need morosinase and you need glucorephanin uh, together. Um, so can you have the broccoli as a source of glucorephanin and add another source of myrosinase? I mean, besides what might be in your gut, is there other ways of like getting some uh, myrosinase injection in there? Oh yeah, no, there's a, that's a great question. So there are other vegetables and plants um, that also have um, active myrosinase as, uh, as, as well. Um, so uh, if you, you know, cook your broccoli really well and you're worried about not having a myrosinase, things like consuming uh, along with your broccoli um, radish family. So things like daikon um, that has active myrosinase in it, um, mustard, uh, seed in particular also has uh, uh, myrosinase. So there's been studies that have done by just sprinkling uh, ground mustard seed um, onto okay. your broccoli. Um, or uh, uh, I'm not sure in terms of ground mustards that are um, pre-prepared, uh, how active that enzyme would be, but uh, there's definitely been work with the mustard powder uh, that shows that um, activates the, the myrosinase quite efficiently and helps release the sulforaphane. Yeah, the good news is, uh, for in most cases, except for cooking, uh, the myrosinase is pretty stable, right? Um, right. It, it stands up to freezing. It can stand up to drying, maybe a little bit. Uh, so, um, so a lot of the supplements that you mm -hmm. purchase, um, uh, they're either derived from the broccoli seed. Um, and or uh, a freeze dried, uh, you know, broccoli product. Okay. In those cases, the the supplements are um, often myrosinase inactive. But a lot of the supplement companies, um, if you look on the label, uh, try to add another comp uh, another component like mustard or so or something else uh, to to add back the myrosinase. So you you have to look at that a little bit when you're looking at your supplements. Uh, so. The, the broccoli, so broccoli, the, most of the sulforaphane, from what I understood, or the glucoraphanin is, is present in the, the florets, the little flower, um, not the sprouts, but the mature plant. Um, is it present in leaves? I mean, can, can you get it from other parts of the broccoli, stems, leaves? Uh, yeah, it's it actually is, is distributed pretty uniformly through the plant. Oh, okay. Um, so you eat the whole sprout. Um, if, if you eat uh, the, I know I, I uh, often buy uh, you know, prepared salads that have the, the stock that's mostly ground up like a coleslaw. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's a fine source as well. And I mean, I think we've, there's uh, other forms of the broccoli family. Um, you know, we, we talk about broccoli as the commercial broccoli that we buy in the grocery store in the United States. But of course there's, there's broccolini, um, broccoli rob. Um, I think we're pretty much talking about the same thing regardless. I mean, uh, there's little differences in maybe the amount of glucoraphanin uh, present in, in all cruciferous vegetables, but there's going to be some. Uh, yes, right. yes. Yeah. So, um, it, so even in the broccoli family, um, depending on the the seed um, and in the growing condition, the amount of sulforaphane or glucoraphanin precursor um, can vary uh, quite a bit. Um, but in other food products, other cruciferous vegetables, uh, there is also glucoraphanin, and it's it's just largely in in um, smaller overall proportions than than in broccoli. Uh, but you'll still get it from from other cruciferous vegetables. Well, we're, uh, get, uh, I didn't realize the time. We, we actually have to close things up. People are starting to leave. Uh, so I, I, there was plenty, lots of questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to them all. Um, I, I think, you know, there's lots of questions about preparations and the effects, um, but I, I think we're gonna have to call it here. And so I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today. Um, 
Thank you, Emily, for coming out and talking to us about uh, cancer uh, prevention today. Uh, uh, hopefully, we can bring you back in the future to talk more specifically about your work with um, uh, with with sulforaphane. And in that case, I think uh, you'd like to make some final comments to the audience. Yeah, and a lot of the questions that you're asking about the prep um, will be in that guide, so we'll be sending that out to you. Um, and feel free to contact the the LPI for additional questions. But um, want to thank you all for being here um want to also just uh, impress on uh, if you like these type of events um these events are really only possible with generous support of the donors of the institute and uh, uh if uh, if you'd like to consider um giving we'll put uh, uh, a link into the chat uh, resources are driven to these events but also the research and our students in the, in the, in the, in the institute um, i also as a resource want to point out the micronutrient information center as an amazing source we have an article specifically on these isothiocyanates that were shared as well um, and the the micronutrient information center also has lots of different articles on foods like cruciferous vegetables um, but other foods as well like the um, teas that were also discussed in the chat um, and many other health conditions, cancer, heart disease, and uh, many, many others as well. Um, last but not least, um, I want to mention, uh, if you're looking for more things to that we're offering, will be uh, Linus uh, Pauling's birthday is coming up on February 28th, and we will be holding Linus Pauling Day events um, as well. So stay tuned. Uh, we don't want to spoil a surprise, but uh, we'll likely be doing something uh, around uh, at least some of the topics on Dr. Pauling's favorite vitamin, vitamin C. Uh, so I hope you can join us um, and stay tuned uh, for more details. So again, last big thank you goes to, to all of you um, who took the time to, to spend with me today. I um, hope you learned a little bit about cancer, cruciferous vegetables. Um, hopefully you can run out to your uh, hardware store and uh, get your supplies you need to grow out your own broccoli sprouts. Um, all of us at the Institute uh, really appreciate you being here and taking the time to, to learn more about your health. I know um, it's ready for my lunch and I'm going to add some broccoli sprouts to my salad. I don't know about you guys. We'll see you again. Sounds see you next good. year. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, everyone. Bye.